Leviathan is usually looked at and taught as mainly a piece of social and political philosophy. So you might wonder why Hobbes is beginning it, especially these first five chapters, with a lot of discussions that would seem to be more in the realm of metaphysics and even more epistemology, explaining, for example, where our ideas come from, how we get them, how we can evaluate them. And if you, if you think about what his project is, he's trying to provide a comprehensive philosophy, not just a social and political philosophy, not even something broader in terms of moral philosophy, so including ethics as well, but something even more expansive, even more encompassing, that includes a metaphysics and an epistemology and even something like a logic and a, and a discussion about language. Why is he doing that? Because he wants to articulate what he thinks for the first time, a truly scientific view on the world. And when we think about science today, um, we're often quite distanced from what they understood science to mean back in the 17th century when they're, you know, really at, at the beginnings of what we call modern science and they were seeing science as the way to approach reality itself, to make sense out of everything, including human beings and their thoughts and their activities. Hobbes is going to adopt what we call a materialist point of view. So he's very different than, than somebody like, say, Descartes, who adopts a dualist point of view, where body and mind are different kinds of substances. For Hobbes, there is only material substance. That is all there truly is. There's nothing like a spirit or a soul or, you know, as, as somebody else would put it later on, a ghost in the machine. Uh, everything must be explicable in terms of matter because that's all there, there really is. And matter is capable of taking on particular shapes, particular configurations. Um, matter interacts causally with other bits of matter, so there's cause and effect going on. Matter is, at least in principle, observable and measurable. So on the one hand, we can reduce everything to what we can see, hear, smell, you know, the things that, that come in the realm of the senses. On the other hand, we as human beings are able to develop what we might call laws or, or regularities dealing with the kinds of material objects that we encounter and how they interact with each other, the cause and, and effect uh, connections between them. And we can also apply this to ourself, and that's where Hobbes is, is beginning. A lot of people wanted to do science by carrying out experiments and you know, doing observations, and that's great, that's part of science. But Hobbes is interested primarily in the creature that does science, the creature that is capable, although usually isn't doing this, is capable of developing scientific knowledge and a scientific perspective upon things. So, if we think about what materialism entails, um, what we have going on, you know, are just bodies or corporeal substances, and they're related to each other in terms of cause and effect. One body affects another body, you know, for example, by, well, you know, I write on the board with the chalk, I'm wearing off a bit of the chalk. That's why you actually see these lines here, isn't it? Uh, if it didn't do that, then we wouldn't have any sort of uh, uh, writing. You know, if I do this, it, it just erases instead of writing. Now, there's a causal connection there. And there's an even more interesting causal connection, given that you're watching this and you're seeing these lines here, because that means that something inside of you is being affected by something out here. And you're not even, like, touching it, in, in, you know, in the sense that, like, you're, you're extending out through the camera, you're materially here in this place the way I am as I write on the board, and yet your mind is being affected by these physical phenomena. That's because, Hobbes would say, your mind itself is a physical phenomenon. We're going to get to that in a moment. First, I want to look at these, these uh, ideas here a little bit more. So, you know, oftentimes, you know, we can have very long causal chains where one, think about a pool table, right, and doing trick shots. You hit one ball, you're using the stick to hit a ball, the cue ball. That cue ball goes and hits another ball. 
maybe it doesn't hit the one that you were aiming at, right? Well, we'll make it a little bit funny in this case. So you're aiming at, at the, the eight ball because you're going to win the game, and you, you do a bad shot, and instead you hit your opponent's ball, and um, let's say there's stripes, so you hit the, the 15 ball. Now the 15 ball is bouncing all around the table, and it hits another ball, and that hits another ball, and that hits another ball. Finally, it hits your eight ball, sinks the eight ball, but you lose, right? Because that was slop, uh, you know, in pool parlance, right? You didn't call that shot. But there's this long causal chain of bodies affecting bodies affecting bodies affecting bodies. It can get more complicated than that, because a body, especially like a human body, is actually a very complex machine. Hobbes will have a, a rather outdated viewpoint on this. He thinks of nerves, for example, as something like pulleys you know, and strings, and, and now we know it's electrical impulses. But the same basic idea still holds for much of what we think about, at least with the, respect to the human body. The human body is, in fact, something like a very complex, very complicated a connection of, of systems that are interrelated with each other, which can be understood along the lines of mechanism. That's why we can do things like create an artificial heart, which is a mechanism. It replaces the mechanism of the heart. Is everything reducible to mechanism? Hobbes thinks that it is, so we're going to go along with that. That's a bigger question that we're, we're not going to try to approach here. Let's think about how it would work, though. So, if you have some sort of system, like a human body, you have one thing on the outside, and it's affecting a part of the human body, and then that part affects another part of the human body. And perhaps, you know, there's even a more complex interaction, so that these parts, you know, have a feedback loop, or you make it as complicated as you like. Maybe there's governors, maybe there's all sorts of interesting mechanistic uh, features to this. But the idea is that within the human body, there are all these parts that are connecting with each other and relating to each other in causal ways. So think, for example, of your fear reaction. I jump at you, right? And now you, you can't actually encounter me because you're watching on the video, but I jumped at you and maybe you, you had a reaction, the startle reaction. And maybe because you were taking in this image with your senses, that's a part of you, you suddenly had the fight or flight response, and you had a lot of adrenaline go through your system. That's another part of you, or a whole set of parts of you. And now maybe that provoked you to think, Dr. Sandler's a jerk, or, boy, that was a good example. Well, that would be other parts of you working as well. Now, how do we get to these other parts? Thinking about, you know, thoughts, thinking about complex ideas that we have. So I've got a diagram here. This is oversimplifying quite a bit, but this is more or less tracing out the progress of what's going on in chapters 1 through 5 of Leviathan. If we look at just chapter 1, we have um, the external world, and the human being is a thing within the world, but the human being is almost, you know, you might say a world within itself as well. It's permeable to the outside world. For example, objects you know, have some sort of cause, and they produce effects within us of the senses. So you see this whiteness of the chalk, an example that I've used so many times. Um, you're hearing the words that I'm speaking. You see the light shining off of my, my face, but not so much off of the, the dark corduroy of the jacket. Um, that you perceive perhaps as a blueness or a blackness. You're, you're being affected by certain things. Now, you know, we understand at this point that, that light is a matter of photons or waves, depending on how you want to look at it, and there's a complex causal interaction that takes place there that we don't have to go into. Hobbes didn't have that, that optics science available for him at that time, but what he didn't understand is that the senses are activated by external things. And once they're activated, they are activated materially. He says the cause of sense is the external body or object, which presses the organ proper to each sense, either immediately, as in taste or touch. I'm touching the paper, and I feel that it's smooth, right? 
give myself a paper cut. Hopefully I won't do that with this. You know, I can feel the roughness of it there. That's why you get a paper cut. Um, or immediately as in seeing, hearing, and smelling. You know, there, there's some sort of mediation of the sound waves or the light waves. Uh, smell, there's odors being born in the air. Uh, and he says, this pressure by the mediation of the nerves and other springs and membranes of the body continued inward to the brain and the heart. Hobbes seemed to think that the heart had something to do with thinking, now we, we don't worry about that. Um, although people are talking now about the gut actually doing something, aren't they? Causes there a resistance or counterpressure, the endeavor of the heart to deliver itself, uh, which endeavor, because outward, seemeth to be some matter without. And this seeming, or fancy, is what men call sense, and consisteth as to the eye in a light, or a color figure, to the ear to a sound. Hobbes is saying, look, things affect us physically, and that's what produces for us sensations like touch, or taste, or hearing, or sight. So we have, at, at one level, the senses, right? And animals share these as well. Some animals have many senses, some have different senses than we do. You know, for example, butterflies apparently can see ultraviolet, so flowers look different to them. Ticks have only, you know, a sense of pressure and, and heat, and they, they don't even really know, you know, what's up and what's down. Um, they certainly can't see you when they're biting you. Um, they have very, you know, primitive instincts, suck blood, reproduce. Um, but all of these can be understood in terms of material functions and mechanism. So now when we get away from this, when we go to chapter 2, which is called On Imagination, Hobbes is going to reflect upon how we get past the immediacy of the senses. Now, he doesn't use those terms, and, and why am I talking about this immediacy of the senses? Well, you know, right now, for example, you're seeing me hold my hands up. Ten fingers. You can count them if you like. Now they're gone. Can you remember those ten fingers? Sure, of course you can. Now, how are you able to do that? If all you could do was perceive through the senses, you wouldn't be able to retain anything that then you could compare to it. How would you know that this is the same ten fingers? as previously. That requires more complex operations. That requires, you might say, an overcoming of immediacy, a perdurance of the mind through time. And that has to do with what he is willing to call memory, but also calls imagination. And that deals with images. These are what he calls decayed sense. So, you know, the objects, when they're affecting the sense, it's very vivid. You see the white of the paper here, right? Um, now just imagine the white of the paper. It's not quite so bright. It's not quite so distinct. How many words are on this, this sheet? Ah, who knows, right? Probably 500 or 600. Um, you could count them out. But now just imagine yourself a sheet of paper with 500 words on it. You, you can do that. But again, it's not going to be quite as distinct. It's kind of fuzzy. It's kind of indeterminate. Those are images. Those are things that are going on within our body, or Hobbes would say within our brain, that are preserving the motions of, you know, what originally came to us from outside objects through sense. So memory, when we remember something, we're bringing back something that we originally sensed. You burn yourself on a, on a hot stove, uh, the next time you get near a hot stove and you see it glowing red, you remember, oh man, that hurt like hell. I'm not putting my hand on there again. Uh, you probably did something like that when you were a kid. With me, it was actually pl plugging the keys into the electric socket. And I only had to do that once, um, in part because we acquire memory. Now, the imagination is a faculty that can do more than just remember. It can break things down and put them back together again. So he has some interesting examples here. Of, for, you know, for example, um, a centaur. Have you ever seen a centaur? And I don't mean in cartoons or in movies. Have you ever seen a centaur in real life? No, you, you haven't because they, they don't exist as far as we know. But can you imagine a centaur? Yeah, of course you can. 
And you can say, well, that's because I saw, you know, a Narnia movie where, where there were centaurs, or I, I, you know, I watch these television shows, or I watch, you know, cartoons in which they, they happen, or, you know, I read comic books. Well, somebody had to imagine that, didn't they, in order to put that down? How did they do that? In imagination, when it's being productive, we're taking what's originally coming from the external world and we're perceiving through our senses, and we're taking those images and we're breaking them apart, we're analyzing them, and then we're synthesizing them back into new unities. So now imagine a, a spider that is 30 feet high and climbs on the skyscrapers in New York City, but instead of shooting webs out of, out of its you know, spinnerets, shoots confetti and cotton candy. Now, you've never seen anything like that in your life, right? I don't think you ever will. Um, unless one of you becomes wildly successful and you know, carries out some crazy genetic experiments to make something like that happen. And if you do, remind me of it later on, if you can track me down. Um, but what you did there is you, you used your imagination to put together this whole complex of, of images. We also do that unconsciously, Hobbes says, when we dream. When we're dreaming our minds are actually taking all sorts of bits and pieces of things, and they may be also affected by external objects, you know, it's cold, so he's got an example of it's cold, you dream about, you know, fear uh, because your body is being affected, um, but you know, there, there's, there, we have a whole stock of images that we, we play around with in our sleep, and that's why our dreams are so, so nutty, so crazy, according to Hobbes. He says, um, uh, here we go. Um, it's, it's, it's a hard matter and by many thought impossible to distinguish exactly between sense and dreaming. For my part, when I consider that in dreams I do not often nor constantly think of the same persons, places, actions, and objects as I do waking, nor remember so long a train of coherent thoughts, dreaming as at other times, and because waking I often observe the absurdity of dreams, I am well satisfied that being awake I know I dream not, Though when I dream, I think myself awake. When we're dreaming, we actually believe the crazy nonsense that's going on around us, and we often don't question it. If we do question it, then we can actually have lucid dreams, which Hobbes doesn't talk about here, but it's an interesting phenomenon. Now, he brings up another thing which is really important. Experience. When we remember things over time, because we're observing many similar things happening. When we're placed in situations where we're having the same kind of sense perceptions, we start to accumulate what he calls experience. He says, much memory or memory of many things is called experience. He's quoting somebody else at that point. That's why it's in quotation marks, because that was a commonplace. So he says, again, imagination being only of those things which have been formerly perceived by sense, either all at once or by parts at several times. The former, which is the imagining the whole object as it was presented to the sense, is simple imagination. And, you know, we, we eventually acquire experience. He goes on, and he's going to talk about this a bit later on. Um, I want to to hit on this, um, he talks about the, the role of prudence when he was talking about um, the train of, of thoughts. So he says, um, here we go, um, as we acquire experience, this is in chapter 3, he says, um, we begin to think about causes and effects. We begin to think about how things produce each other. And we can do this in a very systematic way, or we can do this in a kind of on-the-spot way. But human beings are the kind of animals that, that do this more than other animals. That's part of why we're able to, to have the advances that we do. So he says, um, as we do this, we eventually acquire what we call foresight or prudence or, or providence. This is a, a faculty or a facility of figuring out what's going to happen next, or what must have been the case. Now, is this always, you know, going to be correct? No. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, if, if, we're, if we're generalizing too much from too narrow a range of, of experiences, it's very easy for us to go astray. This is how people get themselves in trouble all the time. We actually make movies about this, right? Somebody grows up a certain way, 
everybody behaves towards each other uh, according to certain norms. Suddenly they're in the big city or they're in the countryside or they're in a foreign country and people act differently and they're at a loss because they can't rely on their experience any, any longer. But experience plays a major role in Hobbes' understanding of human beings. Prudence is this ability to think out what would be good for ourselves, what would be bad for ourselves, that's going to have a major uh, significance for his ethics and his political philosophy. Let's go back now to, to other parts of chapter 3. So he's going to talk about what he, what he describes as the train of imagination or the train of thought. Now when he's talking about train, think of a literal train with boxcars connected to each other and they're all going the same direction. Hobbes, of course, didn't have that in mind because trains, locomotives, didn't exist at that time. But, but the notion of train, something following something else, um, he, he had that. And we can talk about a train of imagination, and we can talk about more complex trains of thought. We can also talk about trains of words, and that's going to assume a, a very important place as, as we move further. So he says, um, when we think about something, it, it leads us to thinking about something else, and something else. Now, it can go one of two ways. Sometimes we're just kind of sitting there daydreaming and our thoughts are wandering, as we say, right? But it's never quite so, so random or coincidental. There's always going to be some sort of train that we can follow out if we do enough work and, and realize why we went from this thought all the way over to this thought. But it does at least seem kind of random. A lot of the time, though, we're, we're thinking and we're, we're relying on um, imagination or we're relying on our experience or we might even be doing reasoning because we want to figure something out. We're motivated. Much of our thinking in life is actually motivated. Just like, you know, right now you're paying attention to this video. Why are you doing that? Because you want to understand Hobbes. Why are you doing that? We can trace it out further. Well, I've got to pass this class or it's important to understand the history of ideas. Those are what Hobbes calls ends or goals in this piece. An end is something that we take as, as, as a good for ourselves, as, as something that motivates us, something that gives us a reason to do something. So he says um, when, when our train of thought is regulated by some desire and some design, we're trying to work something out. And this can be all different sorts of things. It could be trying to figure out, you know, what time do I need to make the bread so that it'll be fresh when somebody gets home, whether I should go to the store today or not, whether the person, you know, approaching me in the dark alley is likely to attack me or perhaps uh, is going to guide me to a safer place. All of these are the sorts of things that we carry out thinking about. If I want to date somebody, um, how can I actually present myself in the best way to them and avoid having them see my defects until, you know, they might be more receptive to that sort of thing. We, we do a lot of thinking. We don't realize this, but we're always engaged in some sort of thinking about something, aren't we? So he says, um, from desire arises the thought of some means we've seen produce the like of that which we aim at. And from the thought of that, the thought of that means to that mean. And so continually it's until we come to some beginning within our own power. So let's take dating, for example. Right? Dating is a source of much anxiety for many people early on. After a while, when you acquire more experience, it can, it can stop being so. Although if you have the wrong kind of experience, I suppose it could become even more anxiety producing. And so, you know, think about when you were, when you were, you know, very young and you had your first crushes, you know, maybe in elementary school or middle school or high school. Um, there were different kinds of crushes at, at those different stages. So let's say high school, right? And let's say you weren't, you know, uh, that experienced in, in the dating game by high school, which might be a big assumption for some people. Wouldn't be for me, because uh, I, I wasn't. So, you know, you, you see somebody and you think, Man, I, I, I'm really attracted to them. Um, how can I get involved with them? Okay, so now you start thinking about, well, that requires this, and that requires this, and maybe you start thinking, how do we do this? Oh, we go on a date. Now, how did you know to go on a date? 
Well, you observe other people and you see that, you know, going on dates can be an integral part in getting to know somebody and getting involved with them and having a relationship, right? So then you start thinking, okay, so got to have a date with them. Uh, what do I need to do in order to have a date? Well, I've got to ask them, but that's kind of scary. How should I do that? Um, they don't even really know who I am. Maybe what I should do is break the ice somehow by um, talking about the class that we're in together. Because we're in biology or we're in chemistry or we're in you know, modern literature together, right? And that'll break the ice and then I can say, oh, by the way, see what's going on there is you're thinking about the end that you want, which is an effect, then you're thinking about the cause, which is a means, and the further cause, and the further cause, until it becomes something that you actually can accomplish. And then you hope all these things will fall into place. As it turns out, usually it's not quite so simple as that, right? At every juncture, there's, there's a possibility for things to go straight. But notice what's happened there. You're carrying out a, a reasoning process, a thought process. He says, the train of regulated thoughts is of two kinds. One, when of an effect imagined, we seek the causes or means that produce it. Like, I, I'm attracted to this person. How can I get to date them? How can I be in a relationship with them? The other is when imagining anything whatsoever, we seek all the possible effects that can by it be produced. That is to say, we imagine what we can do with it when we have it. You're walking along, you run into a piece of chalk, and you go, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what I can do with this. You know, and... If you're, if you're kind of daft, you say, oh, maybe it tastes good. Chalk doesn't taste good. I, I, I know, because, you know, I was a kid and tried it out. Um, kids also do things like putting the chalk in their ears or, you know, other places. But then sooner or later, you start thinking, well, wait a second. I've seen stuff like this before. This can do that. That's cause and effect reasoning again. Now, it gets more interesting as we go on. Um, Hobbes is going to talk about language, or as he calls it, speech. There's a connection for Hobbes between words and thought. As a matter of fact, he's willing to say that all that's happening over here can be understood as mental discourse, like a, a talking to yourself inside of your head. But we can also talk to ourselves and to others out in the world using language as I'm doing right now with you. This also has trains and these can mimic each other. As a matter of fact, for Hobbes, most of our thinking is actually done through words, through language. You know, we have some, some stuff at this lower level that might be, you know, not so much done in terms of language, but although it could be framed in terms of it. I see a white thing here. That's language, right? Um, experience, you know, acting in terms of prudence. Sometimes you just have kind of a feeling about things. You don't have to spell it out. But you could, in fact, spell it out if you wanted to. You could make it explicit. A lot of the time... We're actually reasoning or thinking or, you know, working out things through language. So this leads us to, you know, some, some really important points that he's making here about the uses and abuses of language. I'm not going to go through all the, the discussions that he has here because um, I want to keep this fairly short. But notice that in this chapter 4, he is going to talk about ways in which language sometimes leads us astray in our thinking. We assume that because there's a word for something, uh, there must actually be a thing corresponding to that, for example. Or we engage in what he calls absurdity, where we, um, we're putting things together that don't really match. Like when you say square circle. You can say square circle, right? And you can try to imagine square circle to yourself, or, you know, to pick a, another famous example, wooden iron. But there isn't any such thing, because there can't be any such thing. It's, it's, it's absurd. It doesn't, it doesn't map on to reality. It's impossible to get these things to juxtapose or coincide. So it's very important that we be attentive to, to what language offers us, and where it can lead us astray. 
Now Hobbes is going to go on and talk about one other thing that, that's very important, and that is reason or reasoning. He'll say, um, this is in chapter 5 uh, of Reason and Science, he says, when a person reasons, he does no nothing else but conceive a sum total. And he's got this, this analogy here to mathematics. He says, from addition of parcels or conceive a remainder from subtraction of one sum from another. And he says, if it be done with words, it's conceiving the consequence of all the names of the parts to the name of the whole. He's got a, a somewhat complicated way of talking about this. Essentially what he's saying is when we're reasoning, we're doing something analogous to mathematics. We're adding and subtracting. We're multiplying and dividing. And what are we doing that with? We're doing it with words, or we're doing it with thoughts. And quite often we're using the words in order to get at the thoughts. We write our, our thinking down. When you put together a pro and con list, you're carrying out a process of reasoning, according to Hobbes. And he says that um, what we're doing there is putting things together in more and more complicated arrangements or structures. He talks about the syllogism, right? He talks about adding together two names to make an affirmation. What, what is adding together two names to make an affirmation? The chalk is white. Chalk is one word. White is another word. The chalk is white is an affirmation. The chalk is not green. That's a negation. The chalk is white. All white objects are beautiful, therefore the chalk is beautiful. That's what we call a syllogism. That is reasoning. And much of our reasoning, Hobbes says, has to do with causes and effects, because that's what we're you know, particularly interested in. Now, he says something else that's very important here. When we, when we notice that all people reason, that's not the same thing to, uh, as saying that they all have the faculty of reason developed to the same extent. That takes work. That takes the development of what he calls science. And a scientific viewpoint on things is, you might say, the higher expression of this human capacity of reason that chains things down in words where there are no or there are fewer and fewer, because we're trying to strip them away, absurdities. And things can be made clear. So let's think, for example, of something that can be understood in terms of science. Besides the human body, besides the human mind. Let's think about metal, metallurgy, right? Early on, people started figuring out you could mix metals together, they would melt at certain temperatures, some could mix with each other, some couldn't, they would have certain properties that they would confer. Eventually they start figuring out even more complex things, like if you add carbon to iron, it becomes this, this harder and, you know, you can make a much sharper instrument out of, out of it that we call, you know, this metal that we call steel. And there's different ways of doing that. And then they start understanding things like, well, you could fold it and, and make something even sharper that way. And we keep going on and on and on with this sort of thing. And eventually we get something that we call metallurgy, a whole science, a whole art that is based on human reasoning. Now, that's very different than just relying upon experience. You know, the first early people that, that figured out that you could melt ore, I mean, that must have been quite difficult to, to determine. You know, how do you know that you get these stones and you get metal coming out of them? You'd have to get the, the fire pretty hot. There had to be a lot of experiments taking place that were kind of, kind of random. People probably didn't pay attention a lot of the time. But eventually they had some stock of experience. That doesn't tell you, though, how do you do the, the next ore? How do you combine things together? Science, a, a comprehensive, systematic understanding of things, is something that has to develop through a lot of reasoning. And so Hobbes um, is going to talk about this. This is towards the end. He says, um, reason is not as sense and memory born with us, nor gotten by experience only as prudence is, but attained by industry. First, an apt imposing of names. Secondly, by getting a good and orderly method in proceeding from the elements, which are names. And go, going on and on and on and on. Um, and he says, 
And eventually we arrive at what, what men call science. Science is the knowledge of consequences and of dependence of one fact upon another, by which out of that we, we can present out of that we can presently do, we know how to do something else when we will, or the like another time. We can move outward, we can expand our realm of knowledge using science. That's that's a feature of it. That takes us far beyond mere prudence or experience. Now, why has Hobbes been so keen on, on explaining all this? Because he takes what he's doing here as actually being science. He's trying to provide us with an understanding not only how our body and mind are really the same thing and how they work, but what his work, Leviathan, is trying to do.